waited patiently for the Lord. He climbed to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done, and thy thoughts toward us, and there is none to compare with thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your mercies for us. We thank you for the blessings that you provide us for, for us. Lord, we thank you for uh, your awesome power, your faithfulness, your promises. Thank you that we have an opportunity to worship you, uh, whether we're together in the building or uh, separated, that we can still worship you, Lord. And we just pray that uh, you'd help us to, to continue to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, we, we just want to bring Linda before you and just ask you to just continue her healing for her back. Pray for her cousin uh, and his wife and whatever issue that they're dealing with. We pray for Galen's and, and his continued health, Lord, and that you continue the healing there. Pray for Mike and Janelle as Janelle um, battles cancer and as well as Therese. We just want to bring her before you and ask that you continue to heal her. Lord, as the Herndons uh, getting ready to move to Idaho, we just ask you to be with um, the whole family as they take care of all the things they have to take care of and that you go before them and bless them. And uh, Lord, just bless our time as we will continue to worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue our worship with power in the blood.
Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 20. In those days again, when there was a great multitude, and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the multitude, because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their home, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a distance. And his disciples answered him, Where will anyone be able to find enough enough to satisfy these men with bread here in a desolate place. And he was asking them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the multitude to sit down on the ground, and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them, and started giving them to his disciples to serve them, and they served them to the multitude. They also had a few fish, and after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied. And they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces, and about 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. And, he, and immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dethamia. And the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no, no sign shall be given to this generation. And leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand and many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up, they said to him, Twelve. And when I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, Seven. And he, and he was saying to them, Do you not understand? Oh, 
Okay, well, uh, a couple weeks ago I spoke on the feeding of the 4,000 uh, from this chapter, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. We're going to pick the story up this morning in, in verse 10, where uh, Jesus left the crowd that he had fed, and he got in a boat to Dalmanutha. Uh, in Matthew's version, Matthew chapter 16, he said he went to Magadan. Now, just because he used uh, two names doesn't mean it was necessarily two different places. Uh, you could say he went to Fresno County. I might say he went to Reedley. So it's uh, two different names. Anyway, he just finished feeding 4,000, and he's going to continue teaching on the theme of bread. Now, the exact location of where he went is not exactly known, but it is generally agreed it was on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, an, an out-of-the-way place not near any important towns. Mark may have mentioned this place to demonstrate that the Pharisees were continuing to harass Jesus, even to follow him to out-of-the-way places to challenge him. So in verse 11, Mark chapter 8, uh, the Pharisees are still after Jesus. They're asking him for a sign, not because they want to believe, but to test him. A sign would be a visual confirmation that a prophet was authentically from God, could refer to a physical manifestation of God's glory. Now let's look back in Matthew chapter 3 for just a moment. In verses 16 and 17, when Jesus was being baptized, it says, After being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove, coming upon him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the heavens were opened. Spirit of God descended as a dove. Voice from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Would this be considered a sign from heaven? And this has already happened now. We've been studying the book of Mark for quite a while. Now, in the previous chapters, has he done any miracles? Has he cast out any demons? Has he healed anybody? Has he raised anybody from the dead? Let me answer those questions. Yes, 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 and yes. Now, we know the Pharisees could not use the excuse that they had not personally witnessed any of these signs. In Mark chapter 3, when he healed the man with the withered hand, in verse 2, it said they were watching him. In fact, that's why when they decided to kill him, because he wouldn't follow their Sabbath rules. And later on in chapter 3, they obviously know about him casting out demons because they accuse him of using Satan's power to cast out demons. They don't deny that he did it. They've seen the signs, but they refuse to believe. They're not seeking the truth. They're just trying to test him and harass him. In verse 12, it says Jesus was sighing deeply in his spirit. It can be translated, translated as deep groaning. He's grieved for the hardness of their hearts. They've seen plenty of signs, but they have ignored them. Pharisees ignored out of deliberately, a deliberate unbelief. And the Lord is frustrated. Now, Matthew records a longer response, but Mark, true to his style of keeping things brief, uh, gets to the point. He says that uh, the point of Jesus' response is, if what I've done and what you've seen does not convince you of who I am, another miracle will not do it. Now, Matthew records in his response that Jesus referred to uh, the sign of Jonah, a reference to his upcoming resurrection, if you want to... Uh, later on, if you want to compare Matthew 16, 4 with Matthew 12, 39, 40, you'll see uh, this is so. But they're not going to see this sign of his resurrection till later. So verse 13, he says he left them. There's no need to continue the conversation. Now, we see in verse 14, they forgot to take bread with them. They had no more than one loaf in the boat. So... They're somewhere where they can't buy food and they don't have enough. Does that sound familiar? 
Remember chapter 6, there was 5,000 men and women, along with the women and children. They were all gathered, and all they could find was five loaves and two fish. How did that turn out? And then earlier in chapter 8, 4,000 were gathered with only seven loaves and a few fish. So here they are again. Do you suppose they've learned anything? Before we get to that question, Jesus, in verse 15, has a warning to the disciples and us about the leaven of the Pharisees, <coughs> excuse me, leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. He's going to continue on the theme of bread, and he uses the analogy of leaven or yeast. Now, yeast is something that's added to bread to make it taste good. In this case, I believe it represents false teaching that the Pharisees had added to God's word. These false teachings had worked their way into the teaching and training of God's people and had generally been accepted as true by now. In, in Mark chapter 3, remember when Jesus healed the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. According to the Pharisees' false teaching, the leaven that they had added to God's word, Jesus was breaking God's law by healing on the Sabbath. Jesus showed them at that time that they'd missed the point of the Sabbath. And their response was to start to plan to kill him. Over in chapter 7, they're accusing Jesus' disciples over the ritual hand-washing ceremony, leaven that's been added to God's Word. At that time, Jesus used that conflict to teach all of us about the importance of the condition of our hearts, that outward actions without a pure heart are vain. I believe this is what Jesus was talking about when he warned about the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, I'm thinking, was that only a problem for that time, or do we have that problem now? Do any churches, or do we, add leaven to God's Word to make it more palatable to the culture? Do we add or adapt God's Word to make it more politically correct, or more comfortable for ourselves? Have you ever heard someone say to this effect, I live a good life, I try to do the right thing, I think I'm doing well enough to make it to heaven. As long as the good outweighs the bad, if I do enough good things, I think I'll be all right. This idea has been added to God's word, which specifically says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. A very uncomfortable thought. In speaking of the leaven of Herod, Jesus could be referring to the Herodians, who were the political opposites of the Pharisees. The Pharisees prided themselves on all the rules and regulations they had set up, all the things, that, good things they could do to distinguish themselves from the pagans, to make themselves feel better about themselves. The Herodians were trying to blend in with the culture. Could there be a danger for us today to compromise God's word in order to blend in with the culture? Here's an example. I have heard people who claim to be Christians say, I believe Jesus is a way to salvation. They change one tiny word, the word from God's word, the, to a. Now this may seem insignificant, but it leaves room for the idea there are other ways of salvation. This, like yeast added to the bread to make it more palatable, now would not offend people from other faiths, or those who have other ideas of how to get to heaven. And there's plenty of those around today. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verses 6 through 8. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 6 through 8. Peter's talking about Jesus Christ. He says, this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion... A choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. The gospel will offend those who do not believe. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the, the truth 
and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is very clear. He's not a way to salvation. He is the way to salvation. Acts 4.12. I could try to quote it, but I'd probably mess it up. Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven has been given among men by which we must be saved. We receive this salvation from him when we realize that we can't be good enough to save ourselves. We believe that his death and resurrection paid the penalty for our sin and that by believing in him and him alone, we're forgiven and receive eternal life. So this leaven Jesus speaks of can be very subtle and that's why he says, watch out. Stay true to God's word. We need to study it and know it in order to stay true to it. Now in verse 16, we see that as usual, the disciples miss the point. They start to discuss the fact they have no bread. God's word is so practical. When we read the book of Acts and we read the epistles that John and James and Peter wrote, we see wise, powerful, mature followers of Jesus, people he used to carry out his mission. But here in Mark, we get a glimpse of the process Jesus used to teach and train these men. They didn't start out as wise, powerful, mature followers of Jesus. And they, like me, were really slow to get it sometimes. But it encourages me to see that Jesus kept on working with them until he accomplished his purposes for them. Philippians 1.6, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And of course, when the Holy Spirit came, that made a huge difference. We as believers already have the Holy Spirit. So anyway, they missed the point of Jesus' warning in verse 15. Their stomachs were in, empty and this guided the discussion. How are they going to get food? They may have taken the warning to mean, don't go to the Pharisees and Herodians for bread. Remember, they were criticizing us for eating with unwashed hands. Or they were probably arguing about who forgot to bring the bread. In verse 17, I can just see Jesus just shaking his head while this whole discussion is going on. On one hand, he's got the Pharisees harassing him about signs and disbelief. On the other hand, he's got his disciples completely missing the point of his teaching. He says in verse 17, Do you not see or understand? The Greek word see here can be translated to perceive with the mind, to comprehend. I think it's similar to the the sea that Mark talked about last week when John came into the tomb, he saw and he believed. Understand would be to bring separate things together, assembling the clues to arrive at a, a reasonable conclusion. It might be, it might be like, don't you get it? Can't you connect the dots? The reason they don't get it is in his next question, do you have a hardened heart? Now the footnote in my Bible here uh, says uh, could be translated as dull or insensible. Their minds were closed. Not a deliberate rebellion, just missing the point that Jesus is establishing a new kingdom with new principles and the disciples are stuck in old ways of thinking. The things that are important in the world's view are not the things that are important in God's kingdom and vice versa. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 32, 33, and 34. I'll start with 31. Verse 31 through 33. Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now pair this with John chapter 6, over in John chapter 6, verse 32. In John 6, 32, Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And in verse 35, he makes it very clear. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. The bread of this world, the things that the world prioritizes, will feed us for today. The bread of life that Jesus gives by trusting him will feed us for eternity, and that's the priority in God's kingdom. I find myself stuck in old ways of thinking. It's related to the leaven Jesus warns us about in verse 15. The worldly culture, the worldly viewpoint, the cares of this world can worm its way into our thinking, making our hearts dull. And we, like the disciples, are not able to see and understand God's word and the great and awesome things he has for his people. We miss the blessings that he has for us. Now in verse, verses 18 to 21, He's going to go over it again because they obviously haven't got it yet. Verse 18 says they have seen and heard what Jesus has done. Uh, they don't get it yet, partly because they don't remember. There's a good principle involved here. The importance of remembering what God has done. This would be one of many good reasons to be sharing with others what God has done in your life. To remind yourself. Teaching others and sharing with them helps us remember and learn things better. Also, a thankful heart helps us remember. When we stop to thank God for his blessings and name them, we're remembering. That's why we celebrate communion. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So in verse 19, Jesus is patient. Thank God he's patient. He's patient with disciples, and he's patient with me when I don't get it. Sometimes I got to go through tough times as a result of my hard heart and my hard head. But Jesus lays it out for them. God's kingdom is not based on our abilities and powers, but on humility and submission to the Lord and his wisdom, power, and abilities. His bread is different than the world's bread. There were 5,000 in need. Did Jesus take insufficient of supplies to provide an abundance? He asked the disciples, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? They were first-hand witnesses. He had them pick up the, uh, the basket full of broken pieces. I can kind of see them hanging their head, and they're like, 12. And then in verse 20, he said there were 4,000 in need. Did Jesus take insufficient supplies to provide an abundance? And again, he asked for an answer. He said, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? Right. Seven. And he said, don't you yet understand? He could ask me that same question. Do you not yet understand? Now, it doesn't mention it here, but I believe it goes without saying that they didn't starve, even with only one loaf of bread. How about us? Do we understand? Can we learn from what we see and hear in God's word and what we see and hear in our own lives? Or do we have hard hearts? Are we stuck in what the world thinks about what's important? We can trust God to meet our needs. How about trusting God in our ministry? Jesus knows our insufficiencies. He knows the tasks we have are too big for us. And he knows our weakness. He wants us to understand and believe that he will provide what we need for any situation. 2 Corinthians 12. I mentioned this uh, passage two weeks ago, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, and it's still true. I'm going to read it again. He has said to me, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, He has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. You won't hear the world's experts saying that. And his power is not limited. He generously and graciously provides plenty. There's an abundance. Remember, when he broke five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did they pick up? If there were anybody here, I'd ask for a response. And when he broke seven for 4,000, 
How many large baskets full of broken pieces did they pick up? Jesus' bread is not like the world's bread. Jesus' bread is more than enough. Do we understand? Do we believe? Let's pray. Lord, just thank you for your promises. Thank you for the power that you promised to give us. Thank you for taking care of us, for your promises. Help us to focus on the bread that you give and not be distracted by uh, the bread of this world, the world's viewpoint. Help us to seek first your kingdom and then rest in the promise that uh, when we seek first your kingdom, all these things will be added and you will provide. Thank you for that. Thank you for the fact that you keep your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close our uh, worship with turn your eyes upon Jesus.